All right. Um, so I think we can start. Uh, so thanks uh, for joining this uh, session and really making it so far until the end of the day. Uh, this session is going to be about uh, using uh, LLMs to improve data loss prevention in organizations. Before we begin, just a quick uh, introduction. So my name is uh, Asaf. I'm a data science team lead at a company called the Cato Networks. Cato operates in the IT security industry, as do I. I've been there for over seven years now. Uh, worked at uh, multiple companies. Uh, started out as a data scientist. I did some security research. Uh, and most recently, I lead a team of uh, both. Our main uh, research uh, interests and the projects we work on is applying uh, NLP techniques to the world of network and cloud security. And as for the agenda, we're going to start off by going over the concept of what DLP are, specifically the notion of legacy DLPs versus modern DLPs. Uh, and then we're going to show how we can use LLMs to create modern DLP solutions by uh, classifying sensitive documents. Uh, finally, we're going to finish off with a quick uh, demo using uh, TensorBoard, if you are familiar with this tool. And just a quick note here, I am going to assume some prior knowledge and familiarity with the concepts and terminology of doing a deep learning. However, this is still a high-level uh, talk, so we're not going to dive into too much uh, technical details. But it's going to be a bit more theoretical in comparison to the previous talks today. All right, so let's start off by explaining what is a data loss prevention and what is a DLP solution. So a DLP solution aims to uh, prevent misusage of sensitive data. Now, sensitive data could be really any data that is meaningful to the company, whether it's the company's data or it's customer's data. And misusage could be a lot of things. It could be data being exfiltrated outside the net network by a malicious actor. It could be an employee leaking data by mistake, unintentionally. It could also just be not following the compliances and regulations of the company or an external organization like the GDPR, if you're familiar with that. Um, so that is data misusage, and a DLP solution will aim to cover misusage in all of the three different states of data. That could be data at rest, if the data is stored on a server, um, or a database. These days, this is mostly on the cloud. It could be data in motion, so data passing through your network. And it could be data in use. So this is data that is stored on the endpoint device uh, and accessed by the user. So a DLP solution will aim to cover uh, all of these three states, cloud, network, and endpoint. Now, legacy DLP solutions take a pretty naive and basic approach to, to protecting uh, sensitive data misusage. And that is doing pattern matching to detect PIIs. Now, we've talked about PIIs earlier today. There was, they mentioned it on different uh, session. But I'm just going to go over it again on the basics. So PII is essentially any information that can identify you. It could be not just you, but also assets of the company. So it can be a home address, uh, social security number, uh, passport, financial data, mobile phone number, or even a physical IP address of a device. Now, these are some examples, but really what um, defines or is mutual to all PIIs is that they are structured data, meaning they have a structure that is easy to detect. For example, if we take IP addresses, then an IP address will have 12 digits, right? Four numbers bounded between 0 and 255. And you can detect that pretty easily. So uh, legacy DLP solutions use a pattern matching to detect this uh, data. Now, some DLP solutions take this uh, forward and allow the, the, the user to provide these uh, patterns. That is called exact data matching. So in this case, the user will provi uh, provide his uh, specific patterns 
For example, if you don't want to block any IP address that's leaving your company, you could just block the sensitive IPs that, or range of IPs that relate to your specific servers. Um, so this is the basic. However, it's important to note that not all sensitive data has this uh, uh, pattern or is structured. So when the data doesn't have a structure, this is where legacy DLP solutions fall short. Uh, now let's see an example. We are going to uh, show how a legacy DLP solution detects this uh, very sensitive and important uh, 10K form, right? Um, and you might be asking yourself, what is a, a 10K form? If, if you're not in finance, then, then uh, you, you probably shouldn't know this. But a 10K form is essentially a, a report, a financial report that, uh, that uh, public companies release once a year to their shareholders. Um, and this is a sensitive document that you might want to uh, protect from data misusage. Uh, for example, if this file is being sent before its uh, release date, uh, so here, actually, uh, legacy DLP engines will do a good job because we have three uh, PIIs. We have an IRS identification number, and we have information on the, on the company's address, right? So if we create a DLP policy rule that blocks uh, documents that have the company's name and an IRS identification number, this will actually work pretty good. But let's see, let's go over this example, right? So here we have a non-disclosure agreement, a legal agreement that binds two parties together, one receiving sensitive information um, and one uh, giving it out. So here um, we have some information that can be considered as a PAI. We have the company's name, we have the, the address, the, the mail address. But if we, if we write a DLP uh, policy that blocks any document that leaves a network that has the company's address, then that will be a very uh, noisy uh, rule, and it will create uh, false positives. What is really interesting here is the NDA document itself. That is the sensitive information. That is what we want to detect or classify. However, this data is not structured, right? There is no specific structure to an NDA document that you can, uh, you can map or match against. For this, you will need a full uh, text analysis. And for that, we need uh, the language models. Now, uh, language model is, again, something I presume uh, most of you already know, right? It's a, it's a neural network that has been trained on gigantic corpuses of text. Uh, typically more than 10 terabytes of text. Uh, so the training is really done in two, two phases. First, we have the basic training to create a foundation model. And this is the, the most expensive and resourceful uh, part of the training. Okay. Uh, so it's important if you get this assignment from your boss to, to, to let him know that this is something that very few companies do. Uh, really only the, the tech uh, giants these days. But uh, the second phase is taking a generic foundation model that essentially it, it knows language, but it just knows really how to complete uh, text. You give it some prefix and it generates text. The second phase is making it specialized on a specific task. And this is something much more affordable that most companies today can do. So some examples, we can take a foundation model and we can fine tune it to create a chatbot like ChatGPT, right? We can uh, train it to generate code. Some example could be a Copilot. We can uh, train it to translate language, Google Translate. And the final case that we are gonna focus on today is to train it to do text classification and more specifically, we're gonna show how to fine tune a large language model to classify sensitive documents using text similarity techniques. All right, so in other words, we're going to create a text similarity model. Now what exactly is a text similarity model? A text similarity model is a model that um, creates a text embedding, 
or a compact representation, in other words, a vector, in a way that sentences with similar meaning get similar representations. And text with, with different meaning get different representations. So let's see this example. We have the following triplet on the left side, A, P, and N. A stands for anchor, P stands for positive, and N stands for negative, all right? So A and P have the same meaning, right? The quick uh, brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. A speedy brown fox leaps over a resting canine. This is essentially the same sentence with different uh, uh, wording. Uh, but the, the, the negative example has a completely different meaning. So if we take a foundation model before fine-tuning it, um, we might get similar distances between A and P and A and N because it hasn't been trained to, to perform this task successfully. But after we train the model, we expect A and P to be much closer together in comparison to A and N. So, before we go over the exact uh, training phase, we need to define a loss function. Now, a loss function is essentially what tells the network how successful is he doing that specific task. Um, and the loss function that we are interested in is called triplet loss function. So this, this uh, function receives the anchor, the positive and negative sentences and it creates the embedding from the model. And the loss value really depends on the following, okay? So we have A and we have P, the distance between them. And if N, if N's embedding is between A and P in the red zone, that means the model is doing a bad job and the loss value will be positive. If N is in the green zone over here, like way far ahead, way uh, far away from A and P, that means the model is creating a, a, a good representation of the data, and in that case, the loss will be zero. So this is the basic idea of triplet loss. Um, there's also the notion of margin. So the margin helps us control the, the, the training phase of the network. Um, so even if N is further away than A in comparison to P, we still might want to create a, a positive loss value um, because the embedding is still close by and we want N to be far away and next to sentences that have the same meaning at, as, as his does. All right, so, so now that we know the loss function, we can talk about the training phase. Uh, the training goes as following, okay? We have uh, different uh, documents from different sen sens sensitive uh, categories. Um, a, B, C, a, B, C in this example. And we create a training set of, uh, of triplets, okay? Each time we take two sentences from a single class and a sen sentence from a document from a different class, okay? Uh, so, for example, A, A, two sentences from the A class, and B, a sentence from the B class. And this, uh, this makes the training set, which is passed to the, to the large language model, which creates the embeddings. And with the embeddings, we can calculate the, the loss function and back-propagate the error back to the network. And this is uh, a stage that goes on and on until the, the network is finally uh, trained. Now, once, once we have a trained network, we expect uh, the following. We expect it to create meaningful representations. So let's see this, let's see this example, okay? We have three documents, um, a W-9 IRS tax form, a W-2 IRS tax form, and a resume. And we get three corresponding vectors. And we can see that this model um, is successful in creating meaningful representations because the distance between V1 and V2 is very similar, right? And we can measure that using a similarity metric, like cosine similarity. Um, but, but V3 gets a, a low similarity, okay? So this is what we expect after the fine-tuning stage. All right, 
So now we have a model that can create meaningful representations. Um, but our initial task was to create or to do sensitive document classification. Um, so we, st we are still missing one more phase, which is actually pretty straightforward. All we need to do is to collect a set of sensitive documents. And when a new document passes through the LLM and gets an embedding, we will compare the similarity between the new file and all the offline files. And if we see a high similarity, then we can classify this document accordingly. Uh, so for example, here, we have the set called the support set of 10 documents, right? CV, CV documents, tax documents, uh, transactions. And we compare, we compare them to this new document, unknown document, that is passing through the network. Now, the documents that are close by to the new document, or more specifically inside its radius, um, are, as you can see, three tax forms and a transaction. Uh, so we can, we can classify it accordingly. We can do majority class here. We can do a weighted majority um, or just classify it by the nearest uh, neighbor. Um, and that is the basic idea. Hopefully that was clear enough. Uh, and if not, we have a short uh, demo using TensorBoard to show how we can uh, uh, classify a new document using a support set. Okay, so we're going to classify this uh, CV file of uh, Richard uh, Sanchez. Not the crazy scientist from uh, Rick and Morty, but uh, just a made up uh, a resume of a software engineer. This is not real information, so no, uh, no worries about PII's leaking here. And let's uh, switch over to TensorBoard. Um, now, if you're, not, if you're not familiar with TensorBoard, then uh, specifically, it's a great tool to, to view uh, embeddings. And right here, we have the embeddings of our support set. Okay, so we have 485 uh, points or documents in three dimensions, which we created embeddings for. And I'm gonna go ahead and add a color map here by category. So each category gets a different color. And as you can see, the model is doing actually a very good a job in representing the, the sentences because this data is pretty clustered. Uh, for example, we have this light blue cluster over here which represents uh, resume documents. And we have another uh, cluster, the green one, uh, represent, re representing uh, legal documents, or this purple one representing uh, financial documents. And these are all sensitive uh, data types, right? Something that a company would be interested in. Now that we, we viewed the data, we still need to classify the, the CV of Richard Sanchez. Okay, so this is a new uh, file, unknown file. Okay, and I'm gonna go ahead and, and search its uh, embedding, okay? And I'm gonna filter the uh, 10 closest neighbors, right? And let's, let's view their category. So, uh, I think this is big enough. So as you can see, this, these are all resume documents, um, but not just resume documents, but also uh, from professions, uh, in the technical STEM uh, industry, right? So we have a software engineer, a data scientist. Uh, so we can start getting a notion about what this document is. Now, if we set a radius of 0 0.5, uh, we'll get only four documents inside its cluster. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and isolate them. And once we reach this stage, then we can classify the, the document accordingly, right? It could be the, the, really the majority class here, which is a resume of a software engineer. All right, so uh, switching back. Okay, 
So now let's see how we can create a powerful DLP policy rules by uh, combining both resume documents and PII detection, okay? So we have the following scenario. We have an HR representative that is uploading a document to ChatGPT and asking it, can you go over this candidate's uh, resume and make sure he is a good fit for, for our open position? Now, I hope you are aware of the fact that if you use the free version of ChatGPT and you're uploading information, this information can be used for training. Uh, so if you're not aware of that, please be aware of that because you're uploading your personal information to, to ChatGPT. And this is, of course, a, a, a violation. This would be considered a violation of, a, of an organization's uh, data security policy. Um, but now we can write the following rule. This is an example. So we're blocking traffic to ChatGPT if this, if this traffic contains a resume document classified by the LLM and PII information classified by the data uh, or the pattern matching. And this is a very um, advanced use case of preventing data misusage. We can now, uh, we can now handle. All right, so key takeaways. Um, sensitive data is more than just uh, PIIs. We've seen that. It could be the document classification. It could be contextual information. And LLMs really go beyond basic uh, pattern matching to, to detect this, this sensitive data. Um, and, and really combining these two together is, is the way to create a, a modern DLP solutions with very powerful uh, policies and capabilities. So uh, thank you very much uh, for listening. Um, if you want to uh, read more about this research we did in Cato, you are welcome to scan this uh, QR code. And um, that's it on my side. Let me know if you have any, any questions. I'm going to challenge the demo. Could you show me the least similar thing to the resume uploaded? You want to see the least? Uh... Yeah, the, the document that is least like a resume in the data set. So how do you want to see that exactly? Like the, the document with the, the, furthest, distance. the furthest distance from the... Uh... Seems like some legal documents, but what, what are you exactly are you asking? That? Uh, more of just a, sorry, uh, more of just playful understanding of the different, um, just context matching, like how far something is from something else by by being just playing around with the technology. Uh, I think this tool could be really useful for uh, younger generations to get earlier in school and just try to understand the different type of frameworks and protocols we have as like. Resumes are supposed to be one of the skills you learn earlier in life. Here's a bunch in the K-means cl uh, triplet uh, clustering. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think it's kind of cool and would be a fun toy for uh, younger people. That's all. So what is the question? You already showed me. All right. Cool. Oh, okay. Distance is a... Uh... Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. That's 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 pretty. That's a lot. If you talk about cosine similarity, having a distance of uh, zero point one six. Okay. Uh, any other questions? So, do, are there any challenges? Looks like the context window has to be big enough. Obviously, the context windows are growing. Each of these documents have to fit within the context window, which I think the corollary is that it's going to be extremely expensive, right, for us to be able to create that point. So how do you handle those challenges? Okay, that's a great uh, question. Um, yes, uh, obviously for long documents, um, it could be a very long uh, context window. So you also have a trade-off between accuracy and performance and cost, right? But from our experience, just analyzing the first page or the second page of the document is enough to classify it. 
So just, just the analyzing maybe the first 1,000 uh, tokens is enough, and you don't need more than that. So, so really, uh, that's sufficient for, for a context window, and that's a pretty small window, 1,000 tokens. Okay, any other questions? Okay, thank you very much.